All right, welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you that I don't know, my name is Jim Hurl, and I have the honor and the pleasure of serving as director of NCAR. And along with my colleague, Michael Thompson, the deputy director who's here somewhere. Michael, there you are. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Mesa Laboratory this afternoon for an extremely special event, which of course is to honor Dr. Warren Washington, Warren as he's known to all of us, and to congratulate him on his appointment as a NCAR Distinguished Scholar. This recognition is the highest honor that can be bestowed upon a NCAR scientist who is either retired or entered into a phased retirement agreement. We established this recognition about five years ago in 2011 to recognize truly exceptional careers marked by research and service to the atmospheric and related science that is internationally recognized as being of the highest quality with extraordinary influence. And I think we all agree beyond any doubt that these are characteristics of Warren and his exceptional career of both scientific and community leadership. It's simply not possible to summarize Warren's career in a few short moments. And I don't want to take too much time because you're not here to see me, or you're here to see Warren. But very briefly, in Warren's career, he has published more than 200 papers in professional journal journals. He's garnered dozens of prestigious, and when I say prestigious, I mean prestigious, national and international awards, including election to the National Academy of Engineering. He has served as a science advisor, either formally or informally, to every U.S. presidential administration since President Carter. Uh, this includes being a presidential appointee, first under President Clinton and then President Bush, to two terms on the National Science Board, including two terms as chair, and of course serving as a role model and a mentor for generations of young researchers from diverse backgrounds. So I can't help before uh, I turn the stage over to Warren to uh, resist the temptation to show a few pictures. And these are pictures that, no, 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 they're <laughs> pictures with a lot of integrity. They're all available. <laughs> they're all available on Warren's website, his personal website, which you can get to quite easily. And I would encourage you to go to that website when you get a chance to read much more about his remarkable career and the influence that he has had. So I'll start off with these pictures, which you're supposed to ooh and ah. Uh. So Warren was born in 1936 and grew up in Portland, Oregon. He became interested in science at a very early age in grade school, and his autobiography talks about this as well going on to earn a bachelor's degree in physics and a master's degree in meteorology from Oregon State University in 1958. And this picture on the right is when, Oregon, when Warren was a student at Oregon State. His next step after that was to go to Pennsylvania State University, Penn State, for a doctorate in meteorology. And then after that, in 1963, he joined NCAR as a research scientist and became one of the first developers of groundbreaking atmospheric computer models in collaboration with his colleague and friend and our colleague today, Akira Kasahara, who's seated down here. If you can wave, Akira. <laughs> of course, as this research developed, Warren moved from global atmospheric modeling to include representation of the oceans and the sea ice and thus became one of the true pioneers in the field of climate modeling. An Introduction to Three-Dimensional Climate Modeling, which is a book that was written by Warren and his colleague, Claire Parkinson, in 1986, and updated in 2005, remains a standard reference in the field today. Uh, today, Warren continues his research. Now he's making use of our Earth system model, the community Earth system model, to study the impacts of climate change, both those impacts that are occurring today as well as what we can expect into the future. Many of the simulations that Warren has led and facilitated 
NCAR scientists as well as community scientists in performing have been used extensively in both national and international assessments of climate change, such as IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And the 2007 report for which Warren, other NCAR scientists in this room, and colleagues around the world shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore. In fact, what you see here is a letter from Al Gore that I'll come to in a moment. This letter was shared with Warren as part of a night with Warren Washington, which was presented at the National Academy of Sciences in 2012 by the history makers. This was a PBS interview, a live interview with Warren by Ralph Cicerone. Ralph, of course, is another former NCAR senior scientist. He was the president of the National Academy of Sciences, and unfortunately, we lost Ralph very, very recently. But looking at this letter, it's kind of hard to read it here on the screen. I'll have to come over this way uh, if you can't read it. So it's, it's, a, it's a letter from Al Gore to Warren. Warren that says, it's with great pleasure and admiration that I write to congratulate you on being honored by the history makers and science makers at this night with Warren Washington. I'm sure that my friend Ralph Cicerone will do a fantastic job in highlighting your many accomplishments. I wish I could be there with you in person to celebrate. From the time we first met in 1990 and throughout your career, your work on climate modeling and your commitment to the scientific enterprise have made it a pleasure to work with you to carry forward the mission of enlightening the public about the increasing importance of climate change. As a pioneer in your field, an eminent contributor to atmospheric science research, and most importantly, an inspired and gifted educator, please accept my most sincere congratulations and best wishes for much continued success. All the best, Al Gore. And of course, I can't conclude without mentioning that in 2010, Warren received from President Obama the National Medal of Science, which is the nation's highest scientific recognition. The citation for this award was for Warren's fundamental contributions to the understanding of Earth's coupled climate system through numerical simulation, leadership of U.S. science policy, and inspiring mentorship of young people of all backgrounds and origins. So it's my pleasure, indeed my honor, to ask the person who actually brought me to NCAR 26 years ago. He didn't make all good decisions. <laughs> but truly a dear friend of mine, a colleague, a mentor of mine, and I can honestly say someone who I try to emulate every day, both professionally and as a person, to come join me on the stage in recognition of his appointment as an NCAR Distinguished Scholar. Please join me in congratulating Warren Washington. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm going to try to give a, a three separate aspects of my of my life here at NCAR say something a little, little bit about some of the present research I'm engaged in. Second one is to explain a little bit about the U.S. Global Change Program. There will be some humor in this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain how I installed secretly a climate model in the White House. <laughs> And even on, I wouldn't answer questions for the New York Times or the Washington Post. And then my moments as an NCAR scientist here. Uh, first, I'll talk about the science part. <clears throat> I'm working with two excellent colleagues, Susan Bates and, and Ann Rosenblum, whom for uh, on trying to see how will mid-latitude 
change in the future. And I should sort of preface that by saying, if we don't do anything about climate change, uh, we can look at the extremes of what will happen at the end of this century. Uh, we have essentially used uh, a storm tracking software, and Colin has helped us. Uh, he is in, in Joe Trivia's group dealing with the atmospheric model. And what, what we essentially did was we uh, specified ocean, ocean uh, uh, temperatures from previous low resolution coupled models, atmosphere and ocean, sea ice and so forth are coupled. And we looked at sort of a business as usual. It's called, in our jargon, RCP 8.5. And we ran it towards the end of the century. Now, for the atmospheric model, and we used a very high resolution model that's capable of capturing hurricanes and tropical storms. It does a fairly good job of that. I won't go into the, to the details. But we wanted to also look at, at how the higher latitudes would be affected. And that will be the, the subject of my very brief scientific presentation. Uh, so we've since we looked at storm counts for the present climate and for the future climate. Look at this at this map, and you can see on the, the red and yellow are the principal areas of of the storm tracks that are fairly strong in in many cases. <clears throat> and the the legend you can see at, at different pressure levels that uh, if you get sort of red areas, uh, or if you get yellow areas, and you can get different amounts of pressure <coughs> for the core of that, of that uh, storm track. And you can see on the, on the strongest storm tracks are going to be over the ocean areas off of the coast of, of Greenland, or off of the coast of Asia, and in the third area, of course, is is around South America, uh, is around Antarctica, southern hemisphere, so that we can sort of look at the at the storm track st statistics, or the number of storms, I should say. <clears throat> On the blue lines here, essentially show storms for the present climate, and then we we actually ran several uh, thirty day runs, or uh, excuse me, 10-year runs for the uh, business as usual. And, and there's a, a, a downward uh, amount of, of storm tracks. I must have lost the, so here's on the present for the globe storm counts along here. This is for the southern hemisphere. Here's the you know, North Pacific. And, and the present has actually more storms. The, the uh, business is as usual. So there is a big change in the storm tracks, going from 1,500 down to 1,350 or so. You'll, you'll see it in the southern hemisphere. The storm count per year is what we're seeing here. So we, we want to want to sort of understand why do we have fewer storms present in the future. I think that we kind of understand this a little bit. <clears throat> Here I show the extra tropical storm track density. And see that for the present, you have quite a bit of red. Then as you go to the 
future uh, 2070 to 2099 that we have fewer storm tracks. And this is on the difference of these two plots. So uh, just to give some idea of how this works uh, is that we think that as you warm up the planet by the end of the century, you're not going to have the cold areas as intense over the uh, sort of uh, Canada and Asia. Therefore, the, there's less sort of temperature difference. It's what we often call in, in meteorology is less baroclinic. And therefore, on the winds are less, the temperature gradient is less. And you're going to have less intense uh, storms and fewer storms. So that that, uh, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing or, or a bad thing, but that's is is on finding. <clears throat> so we're not going to get as many strong temperature gradients as data in the present climate. Now I'm going to shift very quickly to uh, how to. Uh, advanced participation in the U.S. Global Change Research Program. The reason I'm going to mention this is that I've been the chair of it for the, for the last six years for the National Academies of Science, and we, and we actually work with the, the uh, Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate and another board on the Environmental Change and so Society. <clears throat> and it has been on the, the mechanism for how presidents are able to, their administration to coordinate activities in the U.S. global change program. Just to give you some idea of, of what that means, oops, yeah, here's, here's some history first. Before getting into the, to the details of the U.S. Global Change Program, I want to say something about how it got started since um, I was involved in that. <clears throat> During the spring of 1990, Dan Albritton and I were asked to speak to at the White House on the climate change research to the cabinet in the Roosevelt Room during the term of George Bush the, the uh, first, or the senior. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> on the, on the, the Roosevelt Room is right across from the, from the Orville office in the White House. Come back to some humorous things. Uh, at the end of the, of the meeting, at the presentations, uh, the the uh, science advisor asked each cabinet officer to contribute to this new program called the U.S. Global Change Research Program. And this program was, was formally made into law by the Congress in the same year. As an aside, I also, you know, a few weeks later, installed the simple climate model in the White House at the request of, of John Sununu, the chief of staff. Now, this is on the White House here, West Wing. And the Oval Office is right here. This is on the Roosevelt Room. Uh, now, different presidents, oh, I should say on the Roosevelt Room, the reason it's called the Roosevelt Room is Teddy Roosevelt's portrait on a horse marching off to war uh, uh, is in this room, and that's why it's called the Roosevelt Room. It hasn't changed. On the chief of staff now, at that time, was right here. And different presidents have used these extra rooms in different ways. Some of them have used them as kitchens. <laughs> Some of them have used them as, as where the chief of staff and the vice president who has a, a, a kind of a ceremonial, a uh, ceremonial 
office here, but he also has a, a much bigger office complex in the executive office building, which is across the, very close by, just across the street. <clears throat> when when, when Del, uh, Dan Eldbritton and I were asked to give the talk, I think we were the first people to use a few graphs in that room. Turned out that no one had ever used view graphs in that room. And nobody knew where the plugs were. <laughs> and there were cabinet officers on their hands and knees looking <laughs> all, all through on the on the room looking for a place to plug it in. And they did find a plug. But the plug uh, was so long that the extension cord to, to the, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, U-graph was too short. So it was about, uh, about this high. I couldn't get, over, get, get my foot over <laughs> it. And it was also uh, the heat coming out of the view graph thing was blowing on, on Richard Darman, who was the head of ONB. I wasn't trying to make a point about global warming. <laughs> but, uh, so they found another extension cord, and, and he was able to move to another place. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, it, it was kind of, kind of humorous to sort of see that uh, White House doesn't have always the highest technology. Uh, anyway, the, the, the story about the climate model was an interesting one. Jerry Meal and I published a paper, Climate Dynamics. <clears throat> and it was the first run of, of any of the modeling groups where we tried to put in a reasonable first generation ocean model. And we found that it was showing a gradual warming. We only ran the model out 28 years, but that took a long time because the computers were really slow in those days. And, and it was Newsweek magazine took up that article and uh, wrote a, a sub article about it. Essentially, it says that there is going to be a global warming. Couldn't it be? And it was in, in a certain bound in terms of, of how much warming you know, takes place. It was, it was kind of, the, of a realistic calculation. In other words, most of the warming was taking place in the upper part of the ocean. But there was some heat that was getting down into the well, it turned out I was at a meeting, a DOEV meeting at, at Stony Brook, so I sent a telegram to, uh, to well, it turned out that John Sununu, who was chief of staff, just quoted me. He said that uh, not going to change very much. And I said, yes, I think that changes significant. So I sent a telegram to him saying, please uh, think that you, that you misinterpreted it on my result that Jerry Meal and I had. And I, fl I flew home that afternoon and got home and there was a telephone call. John Sununu on the telephone. First question was, Tell me something about these climate models. Are you using finite differences, spectral, or finite element methods? <laughs> huh? Now, this is not a question that, that Donald Trump would ask. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit too technical for him. But uh, he went on to, to ask about, are you using line-by-line -line calculations in the radiation? And I said, well, we're using band structure, but it's not exactly line by line. 
but well, we couldn't afford it on the computers. So it's, well, it turned out that John Sununu has a PhD. He actually got it from, from MIT in electrical engineering, but it was on a fluid dynamical problem. So he kind of knew generally what goes into climate models, although he didn't have everything quite right. It turned out that a couple of weeks later, the president's science advisor asked me to come back and speak with John Sanunu. He actually said, whatever he asked you to do, Warren, he said quietly, don't do it. And that was the true, you know, I had gotten that before I got to Washington, because everybody, the head of EPA, the head of NOAA, the head of NASA, all asked me to come and, and, and be very careful talking to John Sununu. I think I understood why after I got there, because when I went into his office, he had this giant telephone, I mean, about this size. It had to be 50 buttons on it. And uh, people were, were interrupting our conversation. And he would just sort of say, yes, go. Go ahead and do that. Bam. No, can't do that. No. Bam. <laughs> he was taking calls and coordinating the whole structure of the government uh, being very abrupt. But he, he started talking to me about, I want to run the, the, on the model here at the White House. I kept saying, well, tell me what you want to do. And, and we can, and we have uh, Cray computers, and we can run calculations for you of calculation. He says, oh no, I want to do it myself. <laughs> Knew that was scary. <laughs> Can you imagine running the government and then having the same time program? Because he kept bragging. He says, I can, I can do Fortran. And, <laughs> and I, have a, I have a compact 386 computer. <laughs> and I said, well we, well, we can't get it on a small computer like that, it's, you have to do some simplification. And it turned out that as I was coming out of the office after with him for about an hour and a half with the President's Science Advisor, there were two assistants in the, in, I think it was in this region right here, two assistants electric typewriters typing away, and it was very noisy. And I asked uh, the science advisor, well, why would you have typewriters? He said, at a time when you had email at that time, he said, secure. <laughs> we don't want anybody to be uh, uh, getting our messages. So they, uh, they came out as letters or so anyway, uh, as I left, uh, the science advisor, to, uh, Bromley, told me, don't worry, he'll forget it, but he's, he's too busy. To... And it turned out that uh, about six weeks later, I get a call. The call was essentially saying, get him off my back and get him a model we can run. <laughs> I had great power for, 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 for about six weeks uh, as we took a, a model that Jeff Keel, he, in car for those, uh, he, he had a very simple kind of radiative base model, uh, essentially a, a 1D model in the vertical with the atmosphere, you can change on the ocean depth and that sort of thing. Scientific question that John Sununu was trying to 
convey was if we had, if more of the heat went into the ocean and went down to a thousand meters or or more, it would essentially keep the atmosphere from warming up if more of the heat goes into that. Now, most of the people who've talked to John Sanunu, knowledgeable, told him that, but he didn't want to believe it. So he wanted to put, you know, change a, a upper upper level ocean model to one that, that went to a deeper depth. If you do that, of course, you're not going to get much global warming over the next few hundred, well, maybe to three or four or five hundred years to X. So uh, I came back to, to Washington for, for a meeting in a couple of weeks. It was on global warming, but it was an international meeting. And as I walked in, each of the, of the science agency heads approached me and said, I have a copy of that floppy disk. Turned out I didn't have any extra copies, I only had one copy. As I'm you know, talking to them, Secret Service person puts his hand on my shoulder and says, can you come in the back here? There's a telephone call. It was, it was John Sanunu on the telephone call. <laughs> he says, did you bring that disc? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it over there. It's, it's only a few blocks away from the White House. He says, oh, you don't need to do that. Just give it to the to the to Bromley, the science advisor, have him bring it over. I'm going out. Some of the cabinet officers heard me talking on the telephone. So we found a, a PC. I made a copy of, and then they made copies of for the other. Kind of strange, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Because I was really afraid of him saying much about on this model, and this model was overly simplified. And yet, uh, he was trying to prove. And I, I, I warned him. I said, if you, if you publicize about this to the media, then science com community is going to, going to be very critical of how simple the version of the climate model on you have is, not a realistic portrayal of what's likely to happen in the future. Well, I didn't mean to sort of dwell too much on that, but I just want to give you some interaction of, of some of the events in Washington. On the U.S. Global Change Act, in that same year that Dan Albritton and I spoke to the cabinet, um, they passed on this law. It's the U.S. Global Change was charged by law to assist on the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and, and natural processes of global change. And here on they have a definition of global change, which I think is still pretty good. It, it really does talk about the broader aspects of global change more than just climate change or temperature change. And so, the, so on that has been the existing law. Now, on the way it's been implemented, and I'll just look, I'll just uh, sort of say this in, in 2012. On most of the advance of the, of the research funding has gone into advanced the, on, on the science. Some has gone into informed decisions, some into sustained assessments, and some into improving and communicating, educating broader public about the understanding of global change. And I, and I think even after all these years, uh, it still is a, is a pretty good sort of definition of what we have to do to sort of global change. And these are the departments um, and the agencies. I won't go through each one of them. I think you can that list. It's pretty pretty broad. Now, 
total budget is $2.7 billion. And, and, and the way it works is each agency prepares its budget, but it has to fit in the U.S. Global Change Act, our, our law. Then it's, it's, uh, it's worked into OSTP. OSTP is the Office of Science and Technology and Policy of the, of the President. And then it goes to ONB. ONB is the coordinating for the, for the total U.S. budget, our government budget. So that all of this has to be worked. It takes quite a bit of time to get the agencies to agree, the OSTP, and then the ONB. And then on that is what's sent to Congress for out of the president's budget. In spite of what, the, what you hear probably on, on the news, the president's budget really only only budget that probably sets the priorities in a good way. Congress is supposed to do this also, but it doesn't do such a good job. The only thing it does is really emphasize on its own, putting more money here and there. But the most coordinated budget is always on the president's budget. And the, and the way that this works, and here again, I won't go through this long list, is there are interagency working groups who coordinate on the various activities, you know, observations, modeling, uh, social sciences coordinating committee, coordinating scenarios and interpretive science, and also education and indicators. So in the carbon cycle in is another important one. So all of this is, is uh, happening uh, through sort of numerous meetings in Washington. And the committee and, and that I chair of the, of the academies tries to give ongoing advice and, and, and take into account a broad expertise of, of people all the way from scientists to economists to social scientists and so forth. And we prepare a review of the National Climate Assessment and also the US Global Change Strategic Plan, which gets updated every few years. And we, and we even get into things like mitigation. This is just, just one example of how to deal with that that in great detail. Urban environments. We are in the midst of preparing a transition in U.S. global change document for the President-elect Trump administration. And I have some new information about this at the end of my talk. <clears throat> uh, when we had our last meeting, our, our, a, our meeting on this on, on last Friday. Now I'll just talk a little bit about the moments of my career. Oregon State was a, was a school that I went to because I grew up in Portland, Oregon. Tuition was $47 a quarter. We had student protests when it went up to $51. <laughs> How times have changed. Um, I was re recruited to, uh, for uh, a job as a mathematician at Stanford Research Institute in 1959. It was a great experience because Stanford Research institution was just getting into looking at the climate modeling. I was actually doing two things. One is I was just using a, an electronic computer and, and checking equations for both nuclear blasts underground and 
the other half of the job was was actually uh, experimenting with some simple some simple algorithms for solving on the fluid dynamic equations. That was great. At the end of my summer, I said, where can I sort of keep doing atmospheric site modeling? And they listed five schools that, that were starting to have programs in it. Um, I, and I, one of the schools was Florida State. I didn't realize growing up in Oregon that Florida State was segregated at the time because I, I applied. And I got a, a letter saying, can we have a photograph of you? Ooh, that there's something was wrong. <laughs> so I never never applied after that. Uh, so, I, so I I eventually went to do the Penn State. Uh, an excellent opportunity because I worked with, with someone who had worked with the ENIAC computer, which was the first electronic computer in Princeton. And his name was Hans Panofsky. In fact, he and his, and his brother took turns driving Ein, uh, Albert Einstein around because he didn't his father was uh, a historian, on the world's premier historian art uh, at the Institute for, uh, for Advanced Study on the Princeton campus. <clears throat> and it was really interesting to hear the stories about this very, these two brothers. One of them got their PhD at 19, the other is. <clears throat> now I came to NCAR, I was offered a, a very nice salary of 9,000 a year. <clears throat> Things have changed, I think. Then in 1964, Akura Kasahara and I went to have lunch with Phil Thompson. Do you remember that, Akura? At, at one of the local places to have lunch in town, we asked him, if, could we start building a general circulation model? Climate models were called general circulation models in those days. And he said, that's why we, I, I, we hired you. No one had actually talked to us about it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a little less kind of practical aspects of in those early days. You just came, heck, I was here for six months, and then I hadn't filled out an application. But uh, everyone was expected to just keep working on interesting topics in those early days. Uh, one of the issues that was uh, at the time, NCAR was totally supported by the National Science Foundation. Francis Brotherton was the director in 1978, and he was very worried about taking money from another agency or, or department. And so he uh, really pondered about whether we should take DOE funding to do, do climate change experiments. I think our, our emphasis in the early days was to essentially build models that sort of replicated as much as we could. Earth's climate. And I'll show an animation of the early climate out of our models a little bit later. And it was finally did he decided to, to take funding from other agencies under certain con 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 conditions. So I've had the opportunity, as, as Jim explained in my introduction, of giving uh, science advice to a number of, of, of And it turned out that Phil Thompson, who was the first kind of director of the science program here at NCAR, 
had had written, I think it was him. I'm sure he supervised it if it didn't. It was something that was published in the NCAR quarterly. General circulation of testing ground. If you look at this document, uh, it essentially says the, the idea of building a model that would be used as a tool not only for our research here at NCAR, but would be used as a as a common tool for the atmospheric sciences, and especially for university scientists. And universities were our our sort of governing board, if you want to say it that way, essentially helping out provide tools for for the research students and so forth. So it was always in the in the in the domain of being if we build a tool it should be made available so the so that others would be using it too. So in the early, in the early days it was basically early weather and climate models. Although uh, I think it was Akur who, who was the leader of the group in those early days, essentially wanted to use our modeling efforts to look at weather aspects as well as for understanding the climate. Now, one thing to, to sort of mention is in our earliest models, it took us one day of computer time to simulate one day. Couldn't get, make much headway. <laughs> uh, had to be very patient. And we met every morning to see if, if the run went for that one day or not. It usually did, because they gave us the, on the nighttime hours to use our model. Uh, now the, what, what drastically changed was that we had a rapid succession of, of, of supercomputers. Finally started getting ahead. We were able to make faster progress. Uh, in the early days, I worked with, with uh, Jewel Charney on two modeling projects. One was uh, air growth and the prediction of how long could you make a forecast. And at the time, this was 1964, we didn't have our model ready at this time. So when Ed Lorenz and Jewel Charney and George Plattsman came out here, um, they asked if I could help in, in giving some estimate of the pre prediction. The, re the argument was if we can make a two or three week forecast, then we can sell this to the nations of the world. The World Meteorological Organization set up a, a goal of, of, the, of how of we get more observations and better models. We can then predict on the weather much longer. Now, the, the, there, there was a model called the Arakawa model at UCLA. So uh, uh, Jewel Charney asked me on the weekend, on a Friday afternoon, could you fly out to Washington and run on their computer? Because they had a uh, computer at, at the medical school and wasn't being used. And do some calculations where we put in a small error in the observations of our, our, the model and we could see how long we could see before you start getting two different forecasts. One is the original one, and the second one where you have a small change in something like the temperature. How long would it take for them to separate into two different sort of solutions? I got to the airport, young scientist programmer picked me up. I, and he handed me a, a helmet. 
<laughs> Here I am going down the L.A. freeway, holding my bag in the back of a motorcycle. <laughs> I, I get to the, to the, they didn't even give me a room or anything. I got to the computer center, had me sleep there, actually. <laughs> and I ran the computer all night, all the next weekend, uh, all weekend. Didn't get any sleep. And flew back on Monday morning, Denver, plotted up the graph. And I, I showed that of the two solutions, and they separated in between two and three weeks. That was the limit of, of critically accurate forecast. Showed it to Jules Sharney and, and, oh, I should say, for, for those who don't know, Jules Sharney is the person who carried out the first model that, that ran on a, an electronic computer. Princeton at the Institute for, for Advanced Study. And so he was considered on the, on the guru for theoretical meteorology. It was highly re respected even then. <clears throat> so I showed on this graph that I, I, I generated, and uh, it showed that two or three weeks was the upper limit for, for making a weather forecast. That's been, been generally true even now. It hasn't changed. It's a, I'm sure that there's been, been improvements, of course. And then the, the other was on something called geostrophic turbulence. The only humorous story about this part was those who are scientists, it was a proof of, the, of, the, of something called the minus th three power law. The humorous part was Jewel Charney looked at the, at the graph that we generated, immediately called the editor of, of the Journal of Atmospheric Sciences and said, hold the presses, I have a new article. <laughs> Went home that evening and wrote an article. I think occur, I'm not sure if you are the viewers, but two people will review it, and then sent to the editor. The editor accepted it, and it came out a week or so later. <laughs> Only Jewel Charney could have gotten away with that. <laughs> I had the, the pleasure of uh, briefing Margaret Thatcher when she was the prime minister. Very inquisitive. She 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 was organic chemist uh, from Oxford, <coughs> or her education. Humorous part of this one was of, of this story is that she's only able to sort of able to be with us for an hour, even though we went through the elaborate thing with. Security here at NCAR and around the building, all kinds of things. Well, she asked so many questions in the briefing. Her president, when her science advisor stood up and said, Well, it's time for us to go, she looked over and pointed at my view graphs and said, I'm not leaving here until I see every one of those. <laughs> Everybody sat down. <laughs> And then she said, <coughs> well, I th uh, I'm going to meet with Ronnie, and that's Ronald Reagan, uh, up at Aspen. I'm going to tell him this is a serious problem we have to deal with. So that was very nice. A briefing of Al Gore when he was senator, and I, I took part in several of these things with Al Gore. When he was our vice president, I remember that Jim Hansen, I, and Suki Manabi 
asked to come and, and, and brief him about the latest. Al Gore had plotted on a graph about how the CO2 was going to increase. And he did this in, in typical politician fashion. Couldn't reach the top of the graph, so he got on his chair and talked about this is 400 parts per million. And he pointed up, he exaggerated the vertical scale, so he had to stand on the on a, on a chair to make his point that that CO2 was going to be increasing dramatically. Uh, President Clinton appointed me to the National Science Board. Jim said, I, I served six years. And then, uh, just before he left office, uh, appointed me to another six years. I, I served under second President Bush. And we had several meetings at the White House. I don't think he was, he was dead set against This is uh, on the first model that we ran. And essentially, oops. Oh, I need a battery. Batteries always fail at the most inopportune time. Thank you. Uh, oops. There we go. Um, uh, this is the first simulation. Uh, in our model, sort of in 1940, I mean 65 or 66. And what we started with is a very cold atmosphere, but specified ocean temperatures. So you, so you actually start forming very strong high pressure, sort of monsoon type circulations over the thing. After, after five days or six days, and just keep in mind it was very cold temperature, like 270, uh, excuse me, 240. So that's why it's so energetic. Then at the end of maybe 10 days, you start to form very strong gradients and baroclinic waves. Once these baroclinic waves start forming, um, they start moving eastward. And uh, here, here's on the temperature structure. This is sea level pressure. Whoops. Oh, shucks. Lost it all. Stay here for a second. <laughs> yeah, so the point was that even after 10 days of, of this initial run, we were able to generate realistic storm systems model. And then it then it kind of levels off after two, after two years. If this will work or not. So here again, high pressure over here where you get sinking motion sinking motion over the land areas and rising motion over the ocean areas. And then you start to form very strong temperature gradients. These temperature gradients lead to the baroclinic waves, to the, uh, the waves that you see in the typical weather map. And this is actually the uh, day-night version of the sun. 
pushing across for each day. Now, uh, kind of notice, uh, you can see that the, on, the, on the, the, the northern hemisphere has, has big in, you know, differences in the strength of the storms. Where the southern hemisphere um, doesn't have such as large continents in the higher latitudes, and therefore um, the continental effect is much smaller. So to, for, for those mathematicians in the audience, there was a very famous mathematician who stopped here. Kuro Kasahara and I entertained him. His name was Courant, um, Courant Frederick Louis criteria. He's a, he, he was the head of the, of the NYU College University a mathematics, applied mathematics department. He looked at this movie. He was a very short gentleman, five feet tall. But he was, he jumped up out of the chair and said, I wish I was a meteorologist. After he saw this, this early movie, uh, nice that we were able to sort of show that to me. Now, this is our high resolution atmospheric model at a quarter of a degree of latitude longitude. Essentially, shows on the water vapor and we do have two sort of boundary conditions. One is the ocean temperatures uh, on earlier low resolution model for the present, and the temperatures are here. And these blue areas are, are on the water vapor. Here's for the future, uh, 290 or 8.5. So, so this is business as usual. This is this is what would have happened at the end of this century if you didn't do anything about the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. You can see a very dramatic difference in the amount of the storm. In fact, this is only for out to May starting in January. But when it gets around to the summer months, you're going to see very strong hurricane type st structures and cyclones. Also, you'll see uh, very strong flows of uh, moisture, higher latitudes. I think uh, you'll, 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 you'll see storm systems starting to form. Here, here's hurricanes. And For some in the Atlantic, too. And so, for us in the meteorology area, and Kevin talks about this, Kevin Trenberth, who is here, talks about the increased water vapor as being a very strong factor in strength of storms and how that's going to increase dramatically. On here, and I'll be finishing up. Well, as usual, uh, many of you will have seen on the development of the community Earth system model. And now, when we have meetings in the summertime, there are two or three hundred people come, experts in various aspects of climate research, contributing to uh, to uh, a very large community effort. Even a week ago, I was in, in China with my wife, Mary. Interesting to, as I was giving talks, to, to learn that the Chinese now uh, are using our models for climate change experiments. 
I, I think there. I think Jerry Meal told me that there's is it eight or six modeling groups now in China. How many? Eight. Eight, of, eight modeling groups, and some of them are using parts of our model. Their modeling efforts. So the idea of of, of a development of a of a community model is really working. Uh, as many of you know, Ralph Cicerone died about 10 days ago. He was an old friend that Mary and I had dinner with every year for the last few years, actually on, on Super Bowl day. And he, uh, he interviewed me for this show, A Night with Warren Washington. But he also uh, chaired on the committee here at NCAR that s selected me to be the division director starting in, in 1987. Uh, he was the director of the chemistry d division at that time. I feel sad that, that we lost a, a dear and old friend. Also, what is happening in the White House with respect to U.S. global change? program as of last Friday. We have planning working on the conference call for the transition to the Trump administration. Turns out that um, our planning efforts had to change abruptly, sort of abruptly, when Trump was elected president-elect. We were assuming it was going to be Hillary. So uh, we had a conference call on Friday to discuss how we would change the plan. Well, um, we quickly agreed that we're not going to change any of the facts. <laughs> Climate change is real. It's going to happen. And, uh, and what we plan to put into the, to the change the planning document, or the transition document, is to explain a little bit more about the science of climate change. I think it's important that they understand some of the, of the background in terms of what we've learned about climate change and what we've learned about how, how uh, climate change can affect of various aspects of, of, of human human life, <clears throat> and for for the ecology as well as the environment. So it just uh, meant that we would essentially uh, carry it out. And the other thing I I learned that is that there won't be a complete kicking out of everybody. Trump administration comes in. It turns out, it turns out that when there's changes of administrations, that there are a lot of career people who are part of the infrastructure that that's going to remain. So I think, uh, for example, at OSTP there will probably be three people who have to actually leave. Top person, deputy, and then there's all, all. So it's three people who, are, who, will, who will probably have to leave as soon as the transition takes place. I'm I'm somewhat disappointed that, that at least I don't hear on the news that uh, the Trump administration is going to appoint the science advisor early on. Uh, typically, the science advisor would, 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 would be one of the people appointed. Some of the presidents have done that. Some of them haven't done it. And, and the reason to have a science advisor appointed is that he can uh, help guide the appointments for NSF, NASA, EPA, NOAA, many other science 
based agencies and departments. And uh, unfortunately, it uh, doesn't sound like that's going to happen. On the Friday meeting, we all agreed that the National Academy report should continue their, on their high standards of peer review. And that's not going to change. And the discovery uh, induced Research will probably still keep getting in most of the funding, but we would also like to see use inspired research get an increase. Hopefully, on that will actually take place. I want to thank Mary, my, my wife, for supporting me and, the, and my family who are here. And I have a big family with 16 grandchildren. And, and I want to thank NCAR for giving me this honor. Really appreciative of it. And I've had a good 53 years here. And I have a, have a couple more. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking forward to retirement. But retirement for me, probably not going to be playing much golf these days. But it'll be mostly doing the things I want to do. Thank you. Thank you.